Sam, come on. Get suited up quicker. The only date you'll have is with an overtime sheet. <laughs> Boy, are you gonna put in some overtime. It's not the first time I've been late on a Dead Space Halloween video, but what can I say? Last month was busy. So with the Dead Space 1 remake on the horizon, I couldn't think of a better time to talk about the spin-off game. The non-mobile one, anyhow. I was as shocked as everyone else seeing the franchise getting a reboot. EA already killed Visceral Games with their very bloody axe, and key developers are working on the Callisto Protocol, which is set in the frying pan universe for marketing reasons. That and graphically, Dead Space still looks pretty awesome. It has some signs of age, but not anything I think would warrant a full remake right now. Some kind of remaster, sure, but a full rebuild is a big task. What could you add? Well, Dead Space Extraction could have some clues. So let's get into what this is. So in the early 2010s, EA was getting big on franchising. You couldn't just have a game a ton of people were buying, you also had to have the spin-off media. Comics, books, anime, they tried everything. If you couldn't go big, you were forcibly sent home. Did you play Mass Effect 3 and think that Big McLarge Huge was a blatant hand-holding character for new players? Well, you're wrong, and not a true fan because it's explained why he asks so many common sense questions in the anime that came out six months after the game. I mean, games like Halo had some great books, but they wouldn't fall into these kinds of trappings until later. Dead Space was no exception, and the reason it was shut down was because they couldn't keep up with EA's ever-growing demand. But they went hard on the spin-off game. Extraction was made as a Nintendo Wii exclusive title, and what better use of motion controls could there be than making the game a rail shooter? It's always been about precision aiming at enemy limbs, so the idea is solid. Plus, EA could figure out how well M-rated games could sell on the Wii, which they don't. Two years later, they ported onto the PS3 with some better visuals. That's the version you'll see being emulated, though I am using a PlayStation controller, because using a mouse for this would be some overkill. Okay, let's get into it. That's, terrible. That's better. Uh, sorry, Lexine, I was next to the recharging station. Are you calling about tonight? No, because then it wouldn't be a surprise. The Skype call opening is very similar to the original game. We're playing a new engineer named Sam Caldwell, and both our characters are still in Ages 7 before the disaster. Lexine here is worried since Sam is minutes away from pulling out the marker discovered on the planet. So this is a short-term prequel, hence the title. Yeah, we got it. So you start off with that fun perspective shift. Unlike the rest of the franchise, this will be entirely in first person. Obviously this is a big gameplay departure, but they keep things surprisingly familiar. To pick up items, ammo, and everything else, you exclusively use the Kinesis module. Where the screen looks and where you go is already decided for you, like every other rail shooter. But there are a few exceptions. Sometimes you are allowed to move the screen around, but this is for hunting items over necromorphs. You'll sometimes see a fuse box you can shoot open to go into a room filled with extra goodies. This replaces the power node and upgrade system from the original game entirely because you have no real inventory outside of ammo. You get new weapons by finding them lying around, and the same goes for upgrades. Health is used the second you pick it up, so no saving it for a rainy day. If you find a syringe, you're shooting it up. Speaking of shooting, they do a good job keeping the HUD minimal. Every reticle for each weapon is different, and it changes slightly when it's in the alt fire mode. When it comes to moving, you occasionally have a chance to pick a path. This can lead from anything to a loot room or a bonus enemy encounter, but you'll always loot back around. I mean, by nature of being a rail shooter, of course it's more simple than Dead Space proper. But the game is great in keeping the spirit of the original. It still keeps the atmosphere and set pieces and weapons, just in a new genre. It's not the kind of spin-off game that you could easily see being in another setting with a new coat of paint. This is a genuine Dead Space game. I'd wager most people wouldn't think that when they hear about the rail shooter spin-off. Going back to the beginning, the tutorial makes some great use of its setting. Sammy C may be on marker babysitting duty, but there won't be necromorphs for quite a while still. So you learn the controls by actually using your tools as tools. You're so used to obliterating meat puppets with these things that you go, Oh, right! This is for work. It could have been easy to drop you into some rando survivor aboard the Ishimura, but they take this time to expand the world out a little more. I'd even say they pace the beginning out better than Dead Space in a few ways. The chaos isn't delayed for too long, but there are stages of it. You know, like having the marker turn on. Three, two, one, mark. It goes from a reactor meltdown situation to realizing the colonists are going insane. This keeps your initial enemies as crazed miners who just keep coming for you. You progress through the colony seeing the madness unfold and your friends losing it too. 
Sam is desperately trying to hold out from this onslaught, and it's clear that he's succumbing to the Marker's influence as well. He does hold out long enough for help to arrive. No! No, leave me alone! I have to get to Lexine, do you hear me? She needs my help! <laughs> Scene. Help me. What? You, you're not. Hostile is down. Repeat. Hostile is down. Good shot, sir. Shooting one of your own is never good. He's not even packing a gun. You're shitting me. This is the guy that slaughtered his entire crew. Why'd you do it, son? Yeah, everyone was going crazy. Sam dies, the game cuts to a week later, and you're playing Space Detective McNeil, who is on the case of why is everyone going crazy after we dug up the evil alien spire. Throughout the game's 10 levels, you get to play as several different characters instead of just one. This is cool since it lets you bounce around different locations, and it does make it unclear who's actually going to survive. This is good because there's not much to the story, so I won't have a lot to talk about. This is every zombie movie we have to get to the boat, or the helicopter, or the extraction point, or- wait, is that why it's called- well, I'll come back to all of that in a bit, but first I want to talk about the visuals. Considering it's a port of a Wii game, it's pretty decent looking. You might see shadows look not quite right in the video sometimes, but that's on the emulator. It does let me play to higher resolution and fire doesn't kill the frame rate, so I can't complain. The actual art direction is great. You do revisit areas from the first game, which of course do look worse, but the new areas fit right in. Even with a lot less graphical power to work with, they still try to maintain that sense of scale. There are parts where they get extra ambitious with this, like showing the whole colony going apeshit. It's vastly bigger than what you see in the original, which did add up in that game since this entire operation was highly illegal, but now it has a cyberpunk skyline that reminds me more of the sprawl. Though to be fair, you were only shown a very small portion of it before. It seemed like they had put down bare essentials that would make the planet crack happen. Here you're shown a lot more of the mining town outside of the workplace. The colony gives its workers high-grade luxuries like a living plant sometimes, which appears to be decorative and not essential. Though knowing the CEC, they actually are and half the colony will die when a tree does. Still, it's a nice contrast compared to returning to the Ishimura. Sure, some minor aspects don't fully align with the deep lore of the first game, but if you need to bend canon a bit to make a better game, then you should probably go for it. The style remains consistent on the new areas on the planet and aboard the spaceship. Don't get me wrong, there is a lot of retreading. You're essentially taking Isaac Clarke's path backwards, complete with juking the final boss early in the campaign. They do remix it with new areas and enemies and set pieces. The new enemies especially fit the part perfectly. Sometimes corpses can serve as bait for a new kind of grabber necromorph, or you have the new flyers that like to hang out in Zero-G. Their visual design fits right in, and that's because they were cut enemies from the original. With the controls of Dead Space 1, fighting enemies flying above you would have been atrocious. Here they fit right in and are only kind of annoying to fight. So the game certainly looks the part, and to no surprise, the sound stacks up too. Me and Vikram are headed for the escape pods now. I'm sorry to abandon you like this, but we don't have any other choice. There are plenty of times when the music cuts entirely and you're just left with the sound of the environment. There are times when it actually sounds better than the original. You have the same audio director and composer back, and with a rail shooter you have infinitely more control over where the sounds will be. When they have so much control, it's more like scoring and mixing for a movie compared to how complicated regular games can get. However, it was still one of the most complex games that we had at the time when it came to layered sound. All the combat sounds are still rich with detail. The music is fitting, but it's honestly kind of hard to distinguish it from Dead Space 1, which on the surface does seem appropriate, but apparently the composer wanted to do something different. EA didn't want the score to go too far out there, so it largely remained similar. In an interview for Bloody Disgusting, he said his favorite tracks to compose were the quiet ambient ones. He liked it because sometimes players couldn't tell there was music playing until it crept in. This does explain why these atmospheric sections can be so effective. It's not always environment sounds, but it's hard to tell. I wish the series had more of this. 
As for the gameplay, well, it's a rail shooter. If you clicked on this video, then congratulations, you can play a rail shooter. Still, there are some details worth going over. First of all, with their big dangly limbs, necromorphs really are the perfect enemy for this kind of game. There's a decent amount of challenge, especially early on when you're restricted to weapons like pistols. The weapons that players are familiar with do come back, and there are some new additions and twists. You have a rivet gun as your fallback weapon, which always has ammo. You use it both for direct damage and for sealing off the grass-fed beef men when they try to chase you through barricades. There's the new pistol, the trusty arc welder, and, as is tradition, a new alt fire for the pulse rifle. Though this one can be amazingly effective in close encounters. Out of everything, the real star weapon is a surprise. The flamethrower. Yeah, outside of particular scenarios, the flamethrower usually just gave you flaming necromorphs. In extraction, it's a melting death beam. Though, due to the angle, it looks more like you're whizzing out a stream of napalm. The intensity and range this thing gets to are more in line with actual flamethrowers. Due to the game's instant weapon cycling, this means you could shoot up a bad man, then switch to the flamethrower for a quick Dresden makeover, then switch right back and keep shooting if you have to. The only thing that can really bog you down is when you have to reload. But Extraction does have an active reload system. If you don't know what that is, it means when you hit a button at just the right time when reloading, it's done instantly. I'm not sure what was the first game to have this, but most people know it through Gears of War. It doesn't punish you too heavily for missing the window, you just miss the window. You're stuck for a moment, but this is surprisingly generous. There is a melee attack you can fall back on, but that's mainly for cutting down obstacles. Plus, you still have stasis and kinesis combat, though sadly you can't pick up their arms anymore. On occasion, you'll get these Operation Don't Touch the Sides puzzles, which are a little more stressful when you're defusing a bomb, but the strongest use of it is when they make you solve a puzzle while being in combat. It's like you're looking away from your work to fire off some shots one-handed. It's a great addition. That said, once again, you don't unlock the harder difficulties until you've already beaten the game, and you keep all of your unlocks. Add on to that the fact a second player can join you, and it's definitely the easiest game in the series. This is good. The hard rail shooters were designed to steal all of your quarters, and they had a lot of issues. Bullet sponge enemies, instant kill drop-in ones, none of that here. It's not the level of fun of playing something like Time Crisis or House of the Dead 2 with a real light gun, but the core gameplay is enjoyable. There's a healthy variety of enemies with decent AI, plenty of weapons to shoot at them with, and they explode real good. So what are the downsides? Well, Extraction is from a dark era of games. This was a Wii game, and even outside of that, companies thought people wanted to have seizures in front of their TVs to pet tigers. So when you get grabbed, you have to shake your controller like it owes you money, and then stop to hit a button. This is a lot more annoying than it might sound. Initially, I thought, why have the button? You know, just shake the controller, and when it's off, you'll see that it's off. Well, there is an enemy that does just that. When the swarmers come, you shake the controller, stop to aim, another one jumps on, you shake the controller, and repeat. It doesn't happen too often, but everything about it is just awful. By the time you're done waggling and the animation ends, another one is already on you. They're not even dangerous, only a nuisance. Compared to the original, if you just need to hit a button if one slips by you, here, it's going to be a whole process. You're already shaking the controller in these areas to recharge your glow stick. Immersion. Now this was part of the selling point back then and would have worked better on the Wii. Or the PlayStation Move. With those, you were already moving your arms around. It wouldn't have those awkward transition periods like a controller has, but I guess they wanted to keep some of that motion aspect in there. Actually, now that I'm on that, this would be an amazing candidate for a VR game. Mechanics-wise, everything is here to make that work. It might not be a port of this game, but a Dead Space VR title wouldn't surprise me. The next issue also isn't that big of a deal, or rather, it would be if the story mattered much. You're always in the hunt for ammo and loot, and for whatever reason, they included some key narrative moments in this. You often only have one chance to grab an item. It's way too easy for any story you have to start getting tuned out. I mean, the writer wants you to go, whoa, look, it's Nicole Dead Space. But the gameplay hasn't stopped. It never does. What happened? Shit. Is this medical? God damn it. Quarantine, actually. Security said they found you in the infected area and wanted you checked out. When was the last time you slept? Only up to 24 hours, I think. It's like you're trying to watch a movie, but someone keeps dangling money they said you could have. Like I said before, it's not like you're missing a whole lot. Most of the dialogue is how do we get to the next area and how do we escape. The only part that seems kind of substantial is saved till near the end of the game. Even then, it's so minimal that it doesn't seem worth going over. They did follow up this story in a barely over an hour DLC for Dead Space 2 that never even came out on PC. It does allude that maybe something interesting is happening, but whatever they had planned was scrapped by the time Dead Space 3 came out. With all of that, I don't have much to say on the details. I did like having a monologuing space detective. It makes it feel like a Space Station 13 round gone wrong. Are you from the ship too? No. I'm a PSEC detective. Nate McNeil. Well, thank you, Nate McNeil. Just doing my job. That look in his eyes reminded me of a kid that went crazy last week. Just an engineer, but something in him snapped. Laser chip wire, ADS shell. Yeah, somebody sure didn't want those things coming down here. I wish they leaned into this way more. 
I'm not sure how people would comprehend the story playing standalone since most of the important bits are inside of text logs. Most are the exact same ones from Dead Space, so there's not a whole lot of expanding in the written word. Which is good in that they didn't expect everybody to play this. All of the prequel kind of moments are of zero consequence. It's more examples like, oh, that barricade in medical. That's where it came from. See, if this was something like Star Wars, this would have a wiki entry. What I find most interesting is that you could kind of see them running experiments for future games. They seem to be aware of all the scares behind glass that Dead Space 1 had. They try to subvert one of these in maybe the funniest way possible. While they don't go with the spooky skull in future titles, you do see some scares that they develop more on. You can especially see a lot of hints for Dead Space 2. You have a walk through the dark Ishimura tram tunnel, banking more on hallucinations and psychological scares was something they'd also be chasing, though it is still mainly something jumping out at you and going brr, brr, brr. There's even a part where a brute swings into fight that's similar to how the Tormentor moves around. While the series never again had a sewer level, it does do something fun here having enemies sometimes hide beneath the water. This is a solid way to build tension and I don't think we see something again like it until Dead Space 3 where they hide under the snow. You don't get new, super violent death scenes or anything particularly amazing, but on a meta level, it is fun seeing the developer try new things and what might scare the player. While most do fall flat now, again, this could find new life in VR. Extraction's story does have one very notable element. It might have one of the most casual reactions to discovering aliens are real than anything I've ever seen. Jesus. So aliens do exist. And they're trying to kill us. Isn't life dandy? What? This is a solid rail shooter. If it's easily available to you, then great, but it's not the kind of thing worth any kind of hassle seeking out. Having played this again and knowing that a Dead Space remake is on the way, it has warmed me up to the idea of it more. There's the obvious thing to look forward to in that it'll have better graphics, though I think everyone is pretty uneven on what changes they'll make, and of course that it's not Visceral doing it. Dead Space 1 did have a lot of cut content between enemies and areas, and some came back for extraction. I could see new areas and enemies like grabbers working great in the main game, and there are still ideas that appeared in no game. I am curious and kind of excited to see what a new studio will do with it. It is incredibly shitty what happened to Visceral, but that wasn't Motive's fault. I don't know if Dead Space will make it huge this time, or if it'll get anime again, but with the right amount of time and talented people, great new material is always possible. That's it for now. There'll be more spaceships next time. <laughs>Dead Space 4 was made, what would I like to see and would I play it? Well, there were plans for Dead Space 4 and I would have played it. If I remember right, the moons are invading and you have to explore around the galaxy trying to find parts and supplies to basically just hold out. Like Dead Space 3's ship graveyard, just on a much bigger scale. Emphasizing survival like that sounds like a lot of fun. Did you know to fight necromorphs you must damage the lit- Yeah, I remember all of Dead Space 1 and that one guy in Dead Space 2 whose recording is in 3. I remember. What 4X games would I recommend for a beginner? It's hard to go wrong with Civilization V. Because sure, endless games are pretty streamlined, but you could give Civ V to someone who's like new to games and they could pick it up pretty okay. What are the first RTS unit quotes that spring to mind? My brain always defaults to like the, sir, yes sir, moving out, followed shortly by nobody here but us trees. Like you might think it would be a bunch of Dawn of War stuff, which is in there, but my brain is just so front loaded with Red Alert 2. I guess Prostagma of Ulamish too, but that's another story. What do you think was the worst video game trend? Probably that games that you paid for can be shut down forever. Followed by really obscene microtransactions, which have calmed down a bit recently. But that's mainly since some governments are starting to label it as gambling. Okay, I'll see you next time. Oh my god. That's who took the batteries out. The fans have closed!